would like to um, invite Danny Conklin, who is our new K-12 Social Studies Director. And uh, I know that you've been wanting to have him come to the committee since he started at the beginning of this year. Yes, do you want to sit down or? Yeah, no, but no, no, you, you, it, the, the mic. Mike is essential for the viewers for, at home. Yeah, you can hold it. Make sure yeah, yeah, you don't walk around with the mic if yeah, you, you want. Like that's, that's a lot. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you need more notes. <laughs> well, we, it, 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 for us, it seems like he's been here a long time. But I know that um, for the for the committee, some of you've had a chance to meet him, and it's an opportunity this evening for the community. Uh, to meet you. So welcome and thank you for being here. Great. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's been, I don't know, six or seven months since I've been to Arlington. Uh, it's been fantastic so far. Uh, just to, um, if you haven't known a little bit of background about me, uh, before I got here at Arlington, I started off my teaching career at Framingham High School, uh, teaching 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade there. Um, after that, I spent some time working at Facing History and Ourselves, uh, doing professional development for teachers, doing coaching on curriculum uh, throughout Massachusetts and Vermont, New Hampshire, and then I was lucky enough to land here um, this past summer. Um, so what I'm hoping to do in this presentation for you all today is give you a little bit of a glimpse into where we've been in terms of history and social studies in the district, uh, where we are in terms of history and social studies in the district, and where I hope uh, we go in the future. Uh, so you can see here from our lovely logo, Arlington runs on history. <laughs> Knock on wood that we don't have copyright lawsuits on our hands. Um, but I see history as a really, really important part of our students' education in Arlington. Um, so hopefully this works. So I've turned into my third grade teacher that didn't know how to use technology. Is the battery okay with that? Make sure the thing is okay. um, So throughout the year, I've worked with different members of our history department to think about what is an adequate mission for the Arlington Public Schools History and Social Studies Department. Um, you can see it highlighted up here. I think one of the most important components of it is having students experience history and social studies in a really authentic, hands-on, meaningful way. Um, a lot of that is through experiential learning activities. A lot of that is also through perspective taking, which I think is such a critical part of learning about history and social studies, knowing that uh, any given historical moment or moment in time is viewed by a different person in many, many different ways, uh, viewed by different individuals in many different ways, um, and helping students make connections to today. Um, one thing that I've really focused on this year in talking to teachers about, and I think is really important, is this last part here um, about cultivating students' abilities to engage in civil discourse. Um, I think that if social studies education can give students one thing, I think it could be that. Um, civil discourse, having students know how to listen to each other, how to talk to each other, how to have you know, conversations with each other. I think that certainly students aren't getting this in the media, they're not getting it in social media, and a lot of times they're not getting it in the community that they live in. Um, so I think that if in social studies and in history, if we can model for students what civil discourse looks like, if we can have students tackle challenging issues in current events or in history um, in a respectful way and have students develop that skill of civil discourse, I think that's one of the best gifts that we can give our students through history education in the district. Forward. Uh, so with that, uh, one of the things that we've worked on this year is uh, identifying academic skills that we think are worthy to be discussing and focusing on in history and social studies and things that are very specific for history and social studies, uh, historical thinking skills or historical mindsets. So you can see that the academic skills that we've targeted as being very important to develop in history, uh, reading, writing of course, research, collaboration, note taking, and then these historical thinking skills that we've deemed are worthy for history education to target on. Uh, so evidence, having students back up the things that they say and the opinions that they have with evidence. Uh, this idea of continuity and change, realizing that there are recurring themes throughout history and social studies, but there are also new inventions, new things that rise up throughout history. Historical perspective, which I mentioned earlier. Um, ethical reflection, I think history more than anything invites students to think about um, different choices that were made in history, uh, tough moments and tough decisions that had to be made in history. 
And the last thing, which I think is also very important, is civic participation. Uh, for not having students think about their role in society and the role that they play in the world that they live in, then I don't think we're doing an adequate job in preparing students to enter into society. Um, um, so where have we been in terms of history and social studies in the district? Uh, this is my quantitative slide with lots of numbers and statistics, which Matt Coleman would love me for doing. Um, if you look at history enrollment, um, last year at Arlington High School, we had 1329 students enrolled in history courses, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. That goes beyond just the core courses in the history department. That goes to the AP courses that we're offering, the elective courses. Sometimes we have juniors who are taking two history courses, seniors that are taking two or three history courses. So we see a very robust enrollment last year, and you can see in the parentheses that this year that's gone up to 1344. Um, and we see that continuing to increase um, with next year's enrollment. Um, at the high school as well, we had 302 students last year that took AP history classes. This year that number is 333, so going up as well. And then some really impressive scores with our AP history courses. Uh, for AP US history classes, we had 146 students taking that last year, with 84% of students scoring uh, three or above. And then if you take a look at our AP psychology scores, 93% of our students scoring three and above. Uh, so this speaks to the robust enrollment we have, as well as the really solid job that our history teachers at the high school level are doing um, in pushing students um, in their AP scores. Also where we've been, just some observations I've made in my studies throughout this year. Uh, we definitely have some solid curriculum maps in place, K through 12 in terms of history. Uh, there's a lot of work previously done by teachers, uh, by my predecessor, Carrie Dunn, in kind of labeling assessments, essential questions, important resources. Uh, so we have some nice curriculum maps in place. Some great partnerships with local organizations. I've been in contact with Jason Russell House, Arlington Historical Society, um, and really trying to continue to foster those partnerships. Um, I think it's what makes Arlington really unique in a lot of perspectives. Um, in terms of the elementary school, um, despite teachers having limited time, I've been blown away by all the things that our elementary school teachers are juggling all the subjects they've teaching, the initiatives in each school, and they still make time for social studies instruction. Um, and it's challenging and it's difficult, but they see it as important, they see the student enthusiasm towards it. Um, so a really great job in the elementary teachers in trying to squeeze that in. Um, I've been really impressed by our secondary teachers and the content knowledge that they've brought. I know that that was one of the things that Carrie Dunn really focused on in professional <coughs> development is making sure our secondary teachers have a strong content background. I think we're really strong in that regards um, in terms of what our teachers can bring to the table. Uh, so now where we are in terms of kind of what I've been doing so far this year. Uh, first off, I started the year with doing some district surveys, elementary school and secondary, asking teachers um, what they thought were strengths of the curriculum, um, areas of improvement that they wanted to see, uh, professional development that they wanted to see in order to be able to have a stronger social studies and history curriculum, resources and supports that they needed. Um, so got a lot of data and a lot of analysis of what the teachers said in the surveys. And afterwards, if you have questions about it, I'm more than happy to talk about that. I was spending a bulk of my time doing classroom visits and walkthroughs. Um, it's fantastic that now I've gotten to all the ele elementary schools, gotten into multiple grades in all the elementary schools. Um, at the middle school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, at the high school walking through classrooms on a weekly basis. Uh, to me, my job, if I lose that classroom connection, if I don't know what's going on in the classrooms, then I kind of I've lost, lost that passion that's brought me into this profession in the first place. Uh, so I really want to make it a point to know what's going on in the classrooms and to know what teachers are doing. Uh, communication has been really important to me. Uh, weekly grade 6 to 12 memos that go out to teachers about PD opportunities, announcements, um, and different other opportunities for students. And then monthly newsletters that go out to our K through 5 teachers um, in terms of highlighting social studies curriculum and things that are going on. One of the important pieces I've tried to do this year is I think our high school teachers need to know what's going on in the elementary school. And I think our elementary teachers need to know what's going on in the high school. So these new letters and memos have been a great way to show pictures, have summaries of what's going on uh, so teachers know. Uh, professional development this year, we brought our secondary teachers to the JFK Museum. We've done PD with primary stores, so continuing that strong Arlington tradition, a very strong PD for our teachers around history and social studies. Um, in terms of new initiatives that we've started this year, 
Uh, we did a review of seventh grade textbooks. Uh, much to my alarm when I got here, <laughs> I saw that our seventh grade teachers were using textbooks for world geography from 1994. Um, a couple of the classrooms that I was in were using atlases and resources from 1978, Ooh. which All is right. a really big issue for me <laughs> um, in terms of world geography. Um, so with the support of Dr. Bodie, Dr. Chesson, the administration, we started a review of new textbooks. Um, <laughs> Got a lot of samples, and the seventh grade team, in consultation with me and other teachers, uh, picked that one up there, Discovering World Geography, copyrighted in 2014, so it's recent, which is wonderful. And it's also more closely aligned with our seventh grade curriculum. Um, so right now, our seventh grade teachers have three or four different books that they're using when they go to the different continents. This has everything in one book, which is fantastic. Um, so hopefully, with the approval of the budget, we can move forward with uh, buying new textbooks, but also pushing us forward to digital textbooks. So we'll have a class set of books, but mostly the subscriptions are going to be online subscriptions that students can access on their iPads, Chromebooks, and at home as well. Uh, we've started a review of third grade books. Uh, so teachers in third grade have been using Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Our Home. Uh, that's out of print, so we've been looking at Mass the Massachusetts story. Uh, so currently all of our third grade teams have this bundle of resources that they're reviewing. One of the fantastic things about the Massachusetts story is it has a lot of great supports for ELL students, and a lot of great supplements for ELL students, um, which with changing demographics in Arlington, I think that's a big strength. Um, another thing that we've been focusing on this year, 6 through 12, has been the establishment of proficiency benchmarks. So the sets of skills that I went over earlier, we've broken down those skills and we've tried to figure out what does it look like for a student to be proficient in historical thinking and evidence in understanding change and continuity and understanding perspectives in history. Um, so our 6 through 12 teachers have been working together in our department time and their PLC time to come up with these proficient, proficiency benchmarks in history and social studies for all seven of those academic skills and all seven of those historical thinking skills, uh, which I know all of you had ahead of time a sample of what's going on with our civic skills and those benchmarks. So our hope is that it's a really great tool for teachers to assess where students are at at the beginning of the year and that our teachers can know and parents and students can know, you know, what does it mean for a student to be at grade level in their history skills and in their understanding of history. Um, so those are continuing. Our eventual hope long term is to roll those down to the elementary schools and that'll do a, a lot, that'll do a lot of work in making sure that we have nice vertical alignment in the social studies program that students are experiencing K through 12 knowing that we have students thinking about historical perspectives in first grade all the way up through 12th grade. Um, and like I said, we have a nice increase in enrollment in uh, AP classes this year. Um, another thing that I've spent probably too much time working on this year is the uh, history and social studies website for the district. Uh, so if you take a look at it, arlingtonss.weebly.com, this is a screenshot of the front page. It's all of the social studies place in one place. You can go for the high school and the middle school, see faculty profiles for each one of our history teachers. You can see curriculum maps, K through 12, of what's going on in history and social studies. Uh, there's a great student gallery uh, work where you can see all the different work that students are doing in terms of history and social studies. And I try to keep it really updated with news and announcements as well. So it's a nice one-stop shop for teachers. The eventual hope to grow this is to have a password protected teacher resource center where they can look up best practices, pedagogy strategies, um, and other different things that can be useful to them. Um, also, what's going on in our K through five schools, I think a lot of people back here are probably the experts, um, and I think all of you probably know some of the things that are going on. Uh, but these are just some snapshots of my travels throughout the district so far. Um, there's some pictures up here from at one of the elementary schools. Uh, fourth graders doing their immigration unit and uh, doing immigration posters for specific stories of individuals and their immigration stories. Um, and the middle picture you can see there is one of our fourth grade classes that was doing a Socratic seminar. And that blew me away to see fourth graders doing a Socratic seminar and watching them. They were more engaged. They knew the rules and what to do in a Socratic seminar better than some of the ninth graders I've seen do a Socratic seminar. Uh, so that's a really big testament to the teachers that we have that are pushing our students and the kids were so excited about participating. Um, then some pictures here of uh, some of our Thompson students doing their mock town hall meeting at town hall, uh, which Mr. Hayner, uh, you helped facilitate and mm -hmm. the students love that. 
Um, and I love seeing the students get up there and present their different warrants and their debating of them. So things going on in the elementary schools, at the high school and the middle school. Up top there, you can see our annual uh, mummification of Cornish game hens to help students get hands-on experience in ancient Egypt. Some of our AP psychology work. So um, our AP psych students took different TV shows and different characters from these TV shows, and they use uh, psych principles to think about the cognitive and psychological development of some of these characters on TV. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see our um, eighth graders doing visual note-taking strategies. So it's no longer just outline format, bullet points, but using visuals to help students understand and take things away from readings. And um, then at the bottom, some of our high school students went to the Ted Kennedy Institute and they participated in a mock simulation uh, debating immigration bills in the fantastic Senate chambers that they have there. Uh, so part of the sim simulation that they have um, at the Ted Kennedy Institute. Um, and then one of the great things, I was talking about civics before, um, integrating civics and the current election into teaching. Um, our six through 12 teachers, I was really impressed with myself. I put together this lovely spreadsheet, which automatically tabulated and got me totals and all sorts of formulas that as a history person, I'm not good at, but I did it. Uh, so we had our six through 12 students spend three days learning about the candidates in their schools and then eventually voting on Super Tuesday for the primaries. And you can see some of the results that came up there uh, in terms of how our six through 12th graders voted. Uh, the bottom pictures are elementary school students uh, setting up little voting booths for them and they voted on their iPads. Um, so having students understand the role that they can play and what role civics plays in their lives is really great to see. Um, we're going to continue to work on that as we build towards the election next year, making sure students have an awareness of what's going on. And then I have to brag about our different organizations and our clubs that we have. Our National History Day students that you can see there just competed in the regional competition this past weekend. Out of the 13 teams that we had, all 13 won awards. Um, 11 out of those 13 teams are now advancing towards the state competition. Uh, so phenomenal work of our advisors, Allison Sensito and Jason Levy, who spent a lot of time with those students. Um, then our mock trial team, which competed at the Massachusetts Bar Association. Um, they advanced to the Sweet 16 round. Uh, they lost the advance team by just one point. Um, but a big uh, shout out to Joe Sensito, who's the um, advisor for that team. So just some great things that our students are doing in the district as well. So kind of moving on, kind of where we're going now in terms of social studies and history in the district. Some district-wide short-term goals. Um, over the summer, we're going to be working with teachers to plan some common election 2016 election plans so that we can have some degree of consistency between what's going on and how teachers are teaching about the election. So what's going on in second grade at Thompson is kind of similar, at least, to what's going on in second grade at Brackett. Uh, we've started a cultural pluralism committee made up of different administrators, different teachers throughout the district um, to talk about different moments in the curriculum where there might be difficult conversations for teachers around race and religion. Um, so this comes up at multiple points in the history curriculum. Um, so hopefully working together as the experts, teachers that are dealing with this on a daily basis to in the long term come up with a set of guidelines so that teachers, if they have these kind of prickly moments around different cultural issues, they have something that they can go to that can give them a little bit of advice or some guidance on how to approach those situations. Uh, Short-term elementary school really working on um, horizontal alignment, so making sure that um, second graders have some degree of uniformity of what they're learning and what they're doing, or third graders have some degree of alignment in what they're doing. So we're gonna be working on scope and sequences for units um, to try to help get some more consistency school by school. Uh, we're going to be revising parts of the secondary curriculum. Um, a big focus of second grade, as you might know, is Japan. Um, but we're going to try to extend that so students are comparing multiple cultures and multiple nations um, so they can kind of have a wider experience. Uh, doing some co-planning with ELA and making sure that we can have some interdisciplinary uh, units as well. At middle school, very excited about possible seventh grade textbooks. Uh, we're working on revising the sixth grade curriculum, which is fantastic. Uh, sixth grade curriculum, as you may know, is a study of ancient civilizations. Right now, that curriculum goes chronologically. We're revising it next year so that it's taught thematically, um, so that we have these geography themes or these world history themes like geography, religion, and art. And students are going to be comparing multiple civilizations, Rome, Greece, Mesopotamia, Egypt, at the same time. 
um, instead of just kind of the siled approach where they learn about Mesopotamia, they take the test, they move on. Uh, they're going to be able to see that all of these things are going on at the same time, and I think it's going to be much meaningful, much more meaningful learning for sixth grade students to see all those comparisons at once. Uh, the high school continuing to expand our AP courses, offer different AP courses. I'm very excited next year about continuing to expand our co-teaching model uh, between a general educator and a special ed educator um, in our history classes, so we can you know really include our special ed students um, in the mainstream history classes as much as possible. And we have some really great work going on at the high school with co-teaching right now, a model that we feel like is working very well for students. Mm -hmm. So just highlight of sixth grade revision. We have some teachers that are testing it out this year. Right now, um, we have two teachers that are testing it out and piloting it. Uh, so they're comparing geography right now for all these different civilizations. I sat in the other day, and I just saw before my eyes how effective it was. I couldn't believe the inferences that students were making. They had research different rivers and bodies of water in each of the civilizations and then they were making inferences about how that affected trade how that affected um, protection during war and it was just connections i saw students being able to make that they might not have been able to make going chronologically through the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, we're going to skip through this slide <laughs> Um, and then kind of long term where I'm hoping to go with the district with social studies and history. Um, district wide again, this vertical and horizontal alignment, um, thinking about how we build a nice sequence of social studies and history, grade K all the way through 12. Um, I think it's really important um, as we start to look at curriculum um, revision that students see themselves represented in the curriculum. Um, so whether that's thinking about women's history, whether that's thinking about LGBT history, whether that's thinking about immigrants and their role. I think it's really, really important that as students are learning about history specifically, that they can see themselves in the story and the narrative of America and in the world. Uh, so focusing on that as well. Um, the history frameworks are going to be revised based on all indications I get from people I know at the Department of Education. Um, so really making sure that we're aware of what's going on with that. Uh, just from people I've talked to, it really seems like we're moving away from content-based standards and frameworks to skill-based ones. So keeping an eye on the Common Core and the C3 standards and making sure that we're kind of ahead of the ball on that um, and the revision that we're doing. Uh, continuing with thinking about text in the digital age, community outreach, um, continuing to revise elementary curriculum, integrating primary sources for elementary schools. Um, middle school, one of the big things that we're going to try to look at and address is right now there's a big gap between fifth grade and 10th grade where students have no U.S. history at all. Uh, so trying to figure out where U.S. history units and case studies can be dropped in uh, in that time period where we can drop in some units on civics so that it's not such a long gap. Uh, so that's going to be more of a long-term thing. It's going to require some teachers changing what they're used to doing, which is always a fun thing to ask teachers to do. Um, and really focusing on a case study approach to history, I think, is the better approach. Um, when you have this argument over breadth versus depth, I'm personally more of a person that says depth because it lets students dive into a really um, small moment in history and make a lot of other connections to other moments in history. Uh, so thinking about that um, at the high school level, looking at more towards common assessments and letting teachers having some common grading to calibrate the way that we're all graded and making sure that students have a more even experience in high school. So that is it. Uh, I just want to thank you all for your support of history and social studies. Um, really excited about the work that we've done so far this year, the work that we have ahead of us. And if you have any questions, I would love to take them. Mr. Heener, first off, I want to thank you. It's a phenomenal presentation, really thank great. Uh, quick question. Um, I was born in 1945, and in American history, we never made it to 1945. Now we've added 70 more years since then. We're a very young country compared to the rest of the world for history. How do you get it all in one year with meaning? Yeah. I mean, right now at the high school, we have US history separated into two years, which is nice, and I think it's um, a luxury that we have. Um, I think we still have some curriculum shifts to make, so our US 2 class, uh, when I taught U.S. in Framingham, we got all the way up through Obama's presidency, wow. uh, which was kind of a wacky thing for me to be teaching about you know, the election of 2000, September 11th. Um, but what I've realized now is that our high school students were just entering kindergarten or not even in kindergarten yet when September 11th happened. 
Um, they have no idea. Some of them don't have memories of this. Um, so I think that, again, goes back to kind of our responsibility as history educators to get them there. Um, but that goes back to, I mean, I think that students have to have an understanding of the Middle East during the Cold War to really understand why we are at the way that we're at today with you know, ISIS and different things that come up in history. Uh, we have to have students have an understanding of the Gulf War, the ramifications that had. Um, so making sure that that US2 history can be honored and that we can have students do that, it's important. One other question, it's a personal thing of mine as well, the Vietnam War and other things. Uh, I re when I started teaching in the 70s, it got a quick brush through and because it was it's still a hot button item. Uh, mm -hmm. Those issues, current issues throughout the world and stuff like that, you mentioned before that you, do you feel you need to train the teachers in, in giving an objective approach to these things? I think so, and um, I mean, I'm lucky that I feel like I have a really good staff that is good at that uh, when it comes to issues of religion or going into the election next year. I okay. think that in a lot of the cases, the teachers that I talk to go out of their way <laughs> to make sure that they're not being biased. Great. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's challenging. Like the first time I taught September 11th, I grew up right outside New York. I had neighbors that were involved in that. Um, and the first time I taught it, like I found myself much more emotional than I would have ever guessed I was gonna be. So I think that it's a challenge. It's an area of reflection for our teachers in their practice as well for thinking about to what extent does their own identities and their own perspectives play a role in the way that they teach and interact with students. So I think that's a constant thing we have to have teachers ask themselves. Thank you. Mr. Pierce. Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Conklin, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, the excitement that I'm getting from just hearing you and watching this reminds me of when Mr. Coleman, Matt Coleman presented to us for the first time as a new department head and how energetic he seemed about uh, what, he w what he was about to do. And I, I get the same sense from you, sir. Um, a Thank couple you. quick questions. Um, uh, I saw a play in Cambridge not too long ago, 1984, and some of the issues resonated with me as to how do we instruct, how do we teach our kids about history in terms of what is truth, what isn't the truth, and, and uh, specifically, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Middle East and uh, the conflicts we're, we're seeing there for so many years. Um, and, and the college campuses that we're hearing about uh, with the divestment issues and, and things like that and bringing people on to college campuses to talk and to talk freely about these issues on both sides. How, uh, as educators, how in the district can we uh, promote uh, free discourse and, and civil discourse and, 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 and also keep in mind, okay, this is history, this is the truth, this, this is a fabricated. Um. Um, so this is the point where kind of my historical nerdy side comes out, because one of my favorite things with history education is this idea of corroboration and corroborating sources. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things that students can do is to get a bunch of sources about the same thing, read all of them, look for bias, look for perspective, and then try to come to a consensus on what it all means. So I think that's one of the things that plays into this idea of civil discourse. Um, I think part of it is challenging students to um, sometimes in debating, argue a viewpoint that they actually oppose because it forces them to research another perspective, another viewpoint that they have. And even though they don't agree with it, um, I think this idea of building historical empathy is something that's really important um, as well. But again, that only goes like so far. Like if you're talking about the Holocaust, like you know, you want to understand in a way like why Hitler did the way the things that he did. But by no means you're ever going to say like what he did was good. So kind of this idea of empathy, historical empathy, I think only goes so far. Like mm -hmm. there's sometimes where you can draw lines in the sand and say, you know, what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, to African American kids is not something that is appropriate. And you can corroborate as many sources as you want. Mm -hmm. and that's still going to be the case. Um, so I think that that's part of the challenge of history too is figuring out, like you said, what are the actual hard facts, and then what is actually the debatable parts about history and. Um, it's always exciting because all these new sources are always coming out, sources are being declassified, and we're getting new views and new lenses into the past. Yeah, thank you. Keep up what you're doing. This is excellent. I'm, I'm so glad to be hearing this. I remember as a preschool kid in 1976 voting Carter uh, Ford, <laughs> and uh, my kids were just doing that with, uh, with the primary here, and they were so excited about it. Um, and they, you know, the sixth grader that I have brought home a list of issues, and he had to put his top five or top three, top five issues and, and we compared as parents if our issues were matched his issues, and it was great, and we loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Allison Happy. 
Thank you. I echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Um, I wanted to speak specifically about the textbook subscription. First, I remember my daughter's now in high school, and I remember how excited she was when she finally brought home a textbook that was not older than she was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she would just be thrilled to know that we're getting new textbooks. Um, first, for our audience out there, I looked up how much. So the textbooks that he's talking about, I think for the seventh grade, are going to cost us $12,000. I'm wondering, can you speak, one, to how long the digital subscriptions last, and two, mm. how, much, how many years of our schools still need replacement? You know, are, is everyone back in 1970s, like, seventh grade, or where are we? No, I mean, the state of our textbooks is pretty good, I would say, in our public schools. Um, in terms of the seventh grade ones, um, it will give us, each classroom will get 30 um, copies of the actual hard um, in-person textbook and then it'll be a six year digital subscription. Um, so by the end of those six years, there's definitely gonna be another edition out and that'll be a good time for us to kind of renew that edition and see what else is out there. Um, I think one of the challenges is that something like geography and specifically thinking about human geography within that and the study of people's movements has changed a lot and the study of it and the way that we're speaking about it and researching it is very different. Whereas in our like eighth grade world history one class, the way that we're thinking about the Protestant Reformation and the Renaissance, yes, there are different perspectives and advances, but it's kind of mostly staying the same. Um, you know, they're adding different whistles and bells into it. Um, so that's why I think the seventh grade one was the most urgent one to replace is because it is a field that develops so fast. Um, I think after it, um, our high school textbooks are in pretty good shape. Um, I think that one of the great things is that we have teachers at the high school and the middle school that don't solely rely on the textbooks, which is a wonderful thing, because textbooks in themselves are biased by the people that write them and by different agendas and whatnot. Um, so even if we have you know, a high school U.S. History II textbook that stops in 2010, I think we have great teachers that are bringing in primary sources, speeches, letters, that are kind of bringing things up to date anyways. Um, so I think that you know, textbooks in themselves are a nice reference point for students. It's a place to get some of the information, but um, the supplemental materials that I see the teachers bringing in, I think is much more valuable in the end. Thank you. Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. My son's um, passion is history, and he's been very lucky to have um, really fabulous teachers, and now that I see sort of what's coming, I'm mm -hmm. we're even more excited about it. Um, I just have a quick question. So he's in ninth grade, and he already started talking to me about um, historiography type of stuff, which I, is, is that the historical perspectives. And I was sort of wondering when, and I was, I was surprised that I was so young, because when I went to school, we didn't learn that <laughs> as, as young. Um, when do you sort of start teaching that, that there are sort of different periods of time where we look at these historical perspectives in different ways? Um, I think that part of it is coming up right now in your son's class because I guess in my world, they're around World War I, yeah. um, going into the Russian Revolution, World War II. Um, so I think that um, in those classes, it begins to come up when we get into the contemporary events. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, it really comes into focus, I think, once we get to 10th grade in US history, because we see in you know, the study of Christopher Columbus, um, different ways that Columbus was written about. Um, some of kind mm -hmm. of our American heroes or founding fathers are being looked at and written about in very different ways. So I think it really comes into play then. Um, and then certainly I think there's a lot of focus on it when we get to the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, thinking about how Reconstruction was written about and you know, how there's the Foner, uh, not the Foner School, there was the, um, I'm blanking on the name right now and I've heard about it, but uh, different periods of history where Reconstruction was looked at as a failure, looked at as a success by W.E.B. Du Bois, and today we're trying to make sense of it. So I think US 1 mm -hmm. is where that really starts to focus itself. Okay, cool, thank you. This has been fascinating. Uh, I, I, I've, I've loved this. Uh, uh, the, when I, when I first started teaching in 1983, I came to the realization that I had students who didn't have any real living connection to Martin Luther King, who was a major figure in my life growing up, and uh, I remember vividly the day he was killed, uh, having grown up in the 60s. Uh, and your remarks about 9-11 and the impact of the generation going through now is being very different, that they're, they're living in a society that has been impacted by it, but they don't have that, that real solid uh, foundation memory of it. And 
the teaching of recent history as history seems to be a very critical part uh, of this, and I'm really glad you're recognizing this. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, I, I noticed that uh, Sanders did uh, one in among the <laughs> secondary schools, but Hillary Clinton did well in the elementary. Do you have any reason for those trends? <laughs> she won the town, so. <laughs> No uh, comments on that. <laughs> and and you, you're talking a lot about civil discourse oh, and yeah. civics. <laughs> and I know that uh, town meeting is a positive force for that, but uh, are, are you finding any impact from this political campaign on your discussion of uh, civil discourse with students? Um, I mean, I think that the current political ca campaign just talking to all my teachers makes it seem even more urgent that we have these conversations <laughs> about civil discourse. Um, it's funny because mentioning, um, you know, Dr. Seuss's comments about historiography, I had a conversation with a colleague today that I'm just fascinated to wonder about how historians are going to write about this election cycle in the future. Um, and I think that's a fun thing to ask students. You know, 50 years from now, are we going to be talking about this election as a blip in the radar or as the turning point where just things completely changed? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you know, this is a perfect reason why current events offer such an interesting lens for students to be able to think about topics like civil discourse and then to be able to compare them to other events that happen in history. I mean, the election of John Adams was also very contentious. It was kind of one of the first mudslinging elections. I mean, it was very early on in the country's history, but you can, you can make a lot of parallels. Uh, you can make a lot of interesting parallels between Donald Trump and Teddy Roosevelt or Andrew Jackson, and our teachers are doing that. And I think it's fascinating for students to be able to be thinking about those things. And it makes it even, they understand why I'm learning about history. Um, so I think it's, it's great. My readings this week have been largely surrounded by the dissolution of the Whigs and the parallels. <laughs> yep. it, 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 it's fascinating. This, this is really a great year to be teaching this stuff. <laughs> Uh, we're, uh, and a personal note, I'm, I'm a former New Yorker. I came up here in 89 for grad school. Where did you grow up? Uh, Rockland County. Okay. In uh, Nyack. Oh, I know where Nyack is. My uh, family, my, my grandfather lived in uh, uh, Montvale. My father did too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's right across the border. Oh, yeah. If you're ever uh, in Nyack, Turriello's Pizza, Best Garlic Knots. Or <laughs> we don't hold it against him. We definitely won't hold it against him. Uh, uh, but you're not a Yankee fan, are you? A huge Yankees fan. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> Can we have some nice civil discourse? <laughs> <laughs> that For baseball allegiances? <laughs> See, I grew up a Mets fan, so uh, you oh. know, it's pretty easy <laughs> to uh, hate the Yankees from a different perspective. Uh, any other questions or comments for I, the chairman? I, uh, I Super Ted. Um, I, I well, this was a fabulous uh, presentation. I think uh, the excitement is really very strong. But the thing, he, he quickly went through the, the mock trial and the, and the national history competition. Our teachers are inspiring mm -hmm. students to work for months mm -hmm. after school in the evening to prepare for these competitions. Six months, uh, our students in the middle school um, worked and, and, and uh, congratulations to Allison Sansonito and Jason Levy for their advi being advisors to this group, but they f did fantastic. Mm -hmm. You must be so proud of them mm -hmm. all. We are. I'm sure. really, really proud of them. I'm super proud of the students. Uh, I was judging National History this past Saturday, and since I work for Arlington, like it has to be blind. You can't know the district that the projects come from. But it was so obvious to me which ones were Arlington <laughs> ones, uh, because the theme this year was exploration, encounter, and exchange. So all of students from other districts did these very straightforward, like Apollo 11, Lewis and Clark, and then our students are doing like Grimm's fairy tales, you know, the diphtheria vaccines, <laughs> um, looking at the passage of women's women's rights bills in international charity work. So just the topics that our students were exploring were so beyond any of the other ones that I saw from other districts. Again, a big testament to Jason and Allison, but just the level of inquiry that our students have in the mm -hmm. district as well. Dr. Allison Ampey. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if we could get any of the kids to come in and mm -hmm. sure maybe be at the toys. start of a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I That'd think be great practice for them before great. they go to states. That's true. Be They're going to states in early April, right? Yeah. yeah. The other part, too, which I, uh, I think is really important for people to hear when Allison wrote me about the results, 
she also talked about how the kids were also recognizing and cheering on students from other mm -hmm. communities. And I, I can't tell you the number of times I hear coaches and people from other districts talking about the behavior and the, the, the comport, um, just the, the general way that the children are presenting themselves. And we should, as a community, mm -hmm. feel very proud of these students because they certainly represent us well. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the, the mock trial. Um, our teams did well and they prepared for six months and they lost, they got to the, to the final 16 and then lost by one point to Boston Latin. So they did a fantastic job, mm -hmm. fantastic. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, you, 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 you thrilled the civics geeks among us. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do that to get elected to these. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you gotta come back again. Thank you. Thank you.